Good Wednesday evening. I'd like to welcome everyone out to this Wednesday evening Bible study. I do want to inform everyone that we are back to all of our services. We're having Sunday school on Sunday at 10 a.m., worship service at 11, uh, Sunday night service at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. So I want to just encourage everyone to come out and worship God, serve God with us here at the Rice Station Christian Church. You know, sometimes when we hear lessons and sermons, we hear preachers and teachers use big words. And we might not always know what that word means. Or sometimes we may be reading the Bible and we may run across a word and we may not understand what it means. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably understand those words because it was probably explained to you somewhere along the way. But that's not true for everyone. So tonight, we're going to have our lesson called Big Bible Words. Big Bible Words. You see, sometimes we preachers can be guilty of something like that as well. You see, we can be guilty of preaching our sermon or teaching a lesson, and maybe we make an Old Testament Bible reference. We might say, well, this subject reminds me of Joseph in the Old Testament. And we all understand why I say that, but when we say that, not everyone in attendance may understand that reference. So they may need us to explain just a little bit more about why this subject reminds us of Joseph. And the same is true with these words that we're going to look at today. So the words that we're going to look at today really describe um, the process that goes on in the life of a saved soul. The process that goes on. And the first big word that we're going to look at is this mortification mortification now i want to start off with this word by saying this word in itself is not in the bible but what it means is is spoken of numerous times the meaning of this word the word mortify means to kill or to subdue and we get our english words mortuary, mortuary and mortician from the same latin root word as mortify so what is biblical mortification? Well, biblical mortification is to die to one's past sins. We die to that sinful nature. We die to the fleshly nature and we die to our past sins and we don't live that way anymore. Now, the Bible teaches that this happens, that we die to these things when we are baptized into Christ. Now, you might say, well, preacher, you talk an awful lot about being baptized into Christ. And that's because there are so many people in this world who teach a false doctrine and say, oh, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. But really, isn't that the epitome of taking away from the Word of God? Because the Word of God tells us we must be baptized. But when we're baptized, that's when this mortification takes place. Let's read about it. Turn with me in your Bibles or in your Bible apps to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And we're going to look at the first seven verses there and see what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with Him like this in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body of sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So our mortification takes place in Christian baptism. We die to the old man of sin. We die to that sinful nature. We die to the fleshly nature. And in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about this sinful nature, the acts of the sinful nature, and it gives us an entire list of all these different worldly sinful things. But then we're told not to live that way anymore, but to walk by the Spirit, to live by the fruit of the Spirit exuding from our lives. 
So when we obey Jesus Christ, we start living with the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us because all the carnal things have been crucified and put away. Look with me in another scripture on this in Galatians 2 and verse 20. There the scriptures say, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we are past, our past sins, everything has been crucified with Christ. So this brings us from the word mortification, which means to be subdued or to die, to the word justification. That's our next word, justification. So let's look at a scripture to start us off on this in 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And we'll look at verses 9 through 11 there. And this is a section of Scripture that I recall a lot because there's so much. Really, a preacher can preach an entire sermon on this section of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9, says, Don't you know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were in the past tense. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Notice... It says right there, there was a time when you were washed, when you were baptized into Christ. And at that moment, you started living in God's justification. This is how some of the people in Corinth had lived, but they'd been justified. Now, the biblical definition of justification is to be just as if you had not sinned. When, you're, when you obey the Lord, you're just as if you had not sinned because it's washed away. So this basically means that God has declared us Christians not guilty of our past sins because we are now living with our faith in Jesus Christ and we have obeyed Him and therefore His blood has washed away our sins so we are just as if we had not sinned. The Apostle Paul spoke about this in, in Romans 5. So let's go over there and look at a verse. And Keep in mind this is Bible study so we're going to be jumping around. Romans 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're just as if we had not sinned, but that usually brings up another question. And here's the question. Is justification just? Is justification just? Or in other words... Some people may say it this way, if God is holy, how can he forgive a guilty sinner? Well, the answer is this, justification does not excuse one's sin or ignore one's sin or endorse one's sin. Rather, our, sins, uh, rather our sin is fully punished because Christ took our penalty for us. He is our substitute. And it talks about that in 1 Peter 3, if you want to turn there with me. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, and I love that whole section there, verses 18 through 21, talks about how we're saved through baptism. But 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. So Christ took our punishment. He is our substitute for our sins. And that remind, makes us know that the wrath of God is satisfied in Christ. And we Christians are freed from condemnation. And God remains both fair and just. He makes us sinners right in His sight when we obey His plan of salvation. So God is fair. God is just. God is perfect. And so He justifies us of our sins. Now it's important to note that justification describes not, does not describe a change in behavior or desire, 
but it describes our standing before God. So we see what mortification is, dying to our sins. We see justification is when we obey Christ, our sins are washed away and we are justified in the sight of God. But that brings us to another word, and that's sanctification, or to sanctify. Remember just a few moments ago when we were reading about the church at Corinth, that the, we saw that they had not only been justified, but also they had been sanctified. To be sanctified or sanctification is defined as set apart for God, declared as holy. The easiest way to describe sanctification is simply being set apart as holy for God. So we Christians have been set apart for God to be His holy people and to live holy lives. You see, unlike justification, sanctification um, does have to do with our behavior and the way we live. But like justification, sanctification begins when we rise from the watery grave of baptism. We are to rise, we rise justified and we live the sanctified life. Now, the Bible does say a whole lot about sanctification. So, let's take a look at a few of the scriptures about sanctification. In John 17, verses 13 through 20, there Jesus is praying, and he's praying for himself, he's praying for his disciples, and he's praying for us followers of Christ today. And look at what he says, and he's talking about the disciples here. He says, John 17, 13, I am coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world but you, that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world. Now let's stop right there for a second. When we're sanctified... We are not of the world. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. And that's something that Jesus is stressing here. And he even, he even says why in verse 16. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. If you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for all who will believe in me through their message. So Jesus is praying for the Heavenly Father to protect His disciples, His apostles, and His followers who have been sanctified through and by Him, through and by the truth. Those who have been made holy and are doing their best to live holy lives. He's praying for us. Now, Hebrews 10.10 10 tells us that our sanctification comes through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, And by that will we have been made holy or we have been sanctified through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. When we look over in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I'll give you a moment, turn there with me. 1 Thessalonians 4, we get this description of us being in the world, but not being of the world. Being sanctified, being holy, being separate from the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. And that's important. While you're turning there, I want to elaborate on that. Being sanctified does not mean that, that we are perfect because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Some people will look at us Christians and say, oh, they think they're perfect. No, we just serve the perfect risen Lord who cleanses us with His blood and forgives us and makes us sanctified through and by Him. He allows us to live in His righteousness, allows us to live in His holiness. We're not perfect, we just serve the perfect God. And we get to live sanctified because of that. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-5 through 5, says this, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be set apart as holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. So he's saying live separate, live that holy life. Do your best to live as much like Christ as you can because Christ is our perfect example. So what it comes down to is we're living in a world where Satan and Satan's demons will work and try to tempt us to be like the world, but we must resist that 
The Bible t- lets us know that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. We need to resist the temptations and resist being like the world and live sanctified lives. So we see that we die to our old self, where that's the mortification. We are justified. We rise justified just as if we had not sinned from all of our past sins. We arise not guilty anymore of our sins, and we live the sanctified life. You see how that process is going along? That's what happens to us when we rise from that watery grave of baptism. So that brings us to one more word, and that word is glorification glorification. As I previously mentioned, we are in this ongoing battle with evil and wickedness and Satan in this world, but the day is coming, and this is good news, the day is coming when this battle will be over and we will be with God in glory, in the glory land, in glorification forever. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And there the scriptures talk about this glorification. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. And he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know, we have a lot of troubles in life, don't we? I mean, sometimes people, they get diabetes, uh, they get cancer, uh, heart disease, just we, car wrecks, things happen, people get injured uh, with, with all that other people hurting each other. And we have all these different troubles and financial struggles and family troubles and just all these things going on in life. And sometimes they seem like they're so heavy. But the Apostle Paul is letting us know that our troubles are light and momentary. No matter how heavy they may seem on this earth, they're light and momentary in comparison with the eternal glory that God has ahead for us Christians. You see, at the second coming, the glory of God, His honor, His praise, His majesty, and His holiness will be realized in us. Instead of us being mortals burdened with the sinful nature, we will be changed into holy immortals. And will be unhindered in the presence of God and will enjoy communion with Him forever. But until that day, we long to be with God in glory. A few years back, uh, the group Mercy Me, they sang a song called Homesick. And that song talks about us Christians getting sick of all the evil and the wickedness and, and the racism and just all the horrible things that go on in this world to the point that we are homesick for heaven. So I ask you, have you ever got homesick for heaven? You know, throughout the years, I've sat beside the beds of many sick people as they were passing on to be with the Lord. And I've heard many of them say, Preacher, I'm tired. I'm, I'm ready to go. And they were homesick. They were homesick for heaven. Sometimes we get homesick for heaven and we long to be in the glory of God. We long to be away from these physical bodies that can get so sick and, and we long for that perfect body that we'll have in glory. We long for that glorification. And the Bible talks about us longing for that. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll read verses 1 through 4. And there the Apostle Paul, he describes this longing. And he says, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, the tent being our body, if this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human human hands. Meanwhile, we groan and long to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He's saying you're in this body and it's so hard sometimes, but one day it's going to pass away and we long for that day to be in God's presence, to worship Him for eternity, to serve Him for eternity, to sing praises to Him for eternity, to be away from all the horrible things of this world for Forever, we long for that day 
of glorification. When we rise to meet the Lord in the air, that day when our body is changed, that day when we receive our reward. When we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. So we see this process that takes place this evening. Mortification, justification, sanctification, and we live that sanctified life, that faithful life. And then we make it to the glory land, to the glorification. So that's these big long words that we hear in church sometimes. And I think it's important that we understand uh, what they mean. So I just want to give you a recap, okay? Mortification, we die to sin when we're baptized into Christ. Justification, we, we raise from the watery grave of baptism. We're just as if we had not sinned. We go to sanctification. We live a life separate from the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We do our best to live that holy life, that faithful life, and we will make it to that time of glorification in heaven forever. And I hope this study reminds us of these truths, of these big Bible words. And Maybe there's someone listening to this lesson tonight, and they're not living a life justified and sanctified, ready to go on and live in that glory land. Well, I want you to know that you can start that today if you obey Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way to be justified. He's the only way to be forgiven. He's the only way to be on track to heaven. And remember what and all he went through. Jesus left heaven to come to earth to show us the way. And then he laid down his life on the cross of Calvary, paying our sin debt. He was buried and he rose and we get to serve the risen living Savior. And then 40 days later, he ascended to the Father. And one glorious day, he's going to come back to judge the world. And we need to be ready. We need to be saved. We need to be sanctified. We need to be justified so that we'll be ready to be glorified. But that only happens if we live out God's plan of salvation. That plan is to hear the word and believe it. Believe in Christ. You must repent of your sins. You must confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You must be buried in Christian baptism, dying to the old man to sin, and rising anew in Christ Jesus. And then you live faithfully all the way to the end. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, I come before you, Lord, and and I pray that if there be anyone listening to this message tonight that's living a life outside of a relationship with you, I pray that they realize they need you that they need to obey you, and that they need to serve you so that they can be with you for eternity. Father, I uplift each name that's on the prayer list here at Rice Station, Father. I know there's so many who are sick and afflicted, some who are on their way to death, Lord, some who have passed away, and I pray that you comfort their families. But I pray that you touch your healing hands upon the sick, for we know you're the great physician. But above all, Father, we pray for your will to be done. Bless your church here. Bless the elders, bless the deacons, bless Andrews. He works with the kids. And we pray all this in Christ Jesus' holy name. And amen.